since the 19th century, the solution to the animals entering shelters has been the same, that you uh, adopt some and then you kill the rest. I was working at a private SPCA in San Francisco, which at the time was the most successful shelter in the most successful community in the country. But it wasn't a no-kill community. I got the opportunity to take over an animal control shelter in upstate New York and take what uh, I thought was possible from the theoretical to the real. You know, how long would it take a poorly performing high kill shelter with a staff that blamed the public, that never saw the killing as their own failure to think outside the box uh, or their willingness to take risks and try new things? Uh, how long would it take to take that model and create a, uh, a no kill community at an animal control shelter where the doors are always open. When I pulled into the parking lot my first day and there was somebody in the parking lot with a box of kittens that his cat had because he didn't spay his cat and you know the kittens weren't his problem they were going to be our problem and I remember literally that's what greeted as I pulled into the parking lot my first day and I remember thinking oh my god what have I gotten myself into. Uh, on my second day, as the cages were full and somebody brought in a litter of puppies, one of my staff members said, uh, turned to me and said, who are you going to kill to make room for this litter of puppies? And I said to them, what's plan B? And they said, we don't have one. That, this is the way we've always done it. So I called a staff meeting and I said to them, look, you know, I didn't drive 3,000 miles from San Francisco to upstate New York to kill animals. I certainly am not going to sign a paycheck to a staff who throws up their hands and says there's nothing we can do and is asking me to put to death these beautiful chubby you know uh, puppies who have their whole lives ahead of them so unless somebody's going to come up with a plan B what I'm going to do is use the paycheck that I pay you and I'm going to board these puppies at a local boarding kennel until I can figure out what to do with them and all of a sudden the creative juices started flowing and I didn't mean to be that harsh and I didn't start out being that harsh but you know they were asking me to do something that custom had reconciled them to, but I saw as the most extreme and the most violent of all possible responses, and that's put them to death. So we weren't even going to have the conversation whether killing was the first resort, you know, when the cages get full, or the last resort when we run out of options. It was going to be no resort. Uh, and when you take killing off the table, then you become incredibly, incredibly creative, and that's what we did. And since we were a rural shelter, we had these um, metal horse troughs and we brought them out and we filled them with shredded paper and we put them in the lobby and we put the puppies in there and you know what better way to showcase these beautiful little gems everybody who entered the shelter had to walk by them and they got much needed socialization and they were all adopted very very quickly and from you know that single act of creativity where we took killing off the table uh, sparked a revolution in our community and virtually overnight uh, you know Tompkins County New York became the first no-kill community community in U.S. history and it was one of those things where you dare to dream. You know, what if you ran a shelter that saved all the animals? Why couldn't we do that? What we have done is created a program that I like to call the No-Kill Equation. It is a series of programs and services that respond to the individual needs of the different kinds of animals or the, the animals facing different issues in shelters. So for example, some animals entering shelters are underaged, motherless, neonatal kittens and puppies. And at a, a traditional shelter, they'd be killed. At a no-kill shelter, you respond with a program designed to, to take care of the particular issue that they need. What they need is round-the-clock supplemental bottle feeding. So we created a foster care program uh, so that the animals can be cared for by volunteers and can be provided the round-the-clock care they need till they're old enough to eat on their own and old enough to be adopted. Uh, some animals entering shelters are uh, scared dogs and again at a traditional shelter the answer was to kill them. At a no-kill shelter we've created um, uh, behavior rehabilitation programs to get them to learn to trust humans and to, to see that humans are actually uh, capable of great love and great joy and 
good things for dogs. And once we help them come out of their shell, we find them a loving new home. Some animals uh, come in sick or injured, and we've created a very specific set of programs to deal uh, with their issues, which is uh, medical care and medical rehabilitation. And so rather than have a single approach that says these animals will find homes for, these will kill, we've created a series of uh, t 10 programs that provide a life affirming alternative to killing that gets animals ready for life as cherished companions and then we kick off our comprehensive uh, marketing and adoption program to get those animals into loving new homes and it has been wildly successful. You know, all the justifications used to kill animals have all been proven false. It's just the simple one of uh, you know there's too many animals and not enough homes. If you were to ask shelter directors still killing the bulk of the animals in their shelters, uh, okay, so you're arguing that there is this supply-demand imbalance. Uh, what is the supply? They can tell you that, and that's the number of animals that, are, that they kill every year. What is the demand for animals? I mean, if you're going to argue a supply-demand imbalance, too many animals, not enough homes, you need to know the demand side of the question, and nobody thought to ask that. And when we started looking at it around the country, we knew about four million uh, animals are killed in shelters every year. About three million are being killed because of lack of a home. And the question is, can we find homes for three million animals a year? And uh, the data there is even more optimistic uh, because every year in the United States, there's roughly 23 and a half million people that add a new animal uh, to their home. Now, the reality is some of those are uh, already committed to adopting from a shelter. Those are the ones that uh, are currently being saved. Uh, and the reality is whether we like it or not, whether we think it's a good idea or not, that uh, some of those people are already committed to uh, buying from a breeder or another commercial source. Uh, but what we found is that about 17 million uh, people uh, have not decided uh, where they're going to get their next animal from. And surveys show that they can be influenced to adopt from a shelter. And so the challenge isn't about uh, too many animals, not enough homes. The challenge is uh, one of market share. We need to do a better job marketing our animals, uh, and we need to keep the animals alive long enough so that they can make it into their, those homes. Today we have 200 cities and towns across the country, about 54 different counties that have ended the killing of savable animals in their shelters and they have returned the term euthanasia to its dictionary definition and uh, essentially what it was meant to be from the beginning. I am Nathan Winograd. I am the executive director of the No Kill Advocacy Center. Um, I spend my days and nights trying to end the killing of animals in shelters, and you are watching the World Animal Awareness Society.